down these okay. little. Okay, yeah. let's take yeah. it from the top. All right, well, all right, so we'll sing a little dolly first, and then she'll go back to New York. Is that okay? Or Put the glass you? away. That, uh, that I hate to see you fish. Yeah. Oh yeah, that right. no fish. Then you won't have to do it. Because he's got half the song, which is not too good. He wants the oh. whole song. I tell you, there are three. There are at least two good places to be. One of them is Chicago, and one of them is New York. And I'll start off with Chicago, hey, and then you'll come into New York. I want to sing Dolly. All right, we'll sing Hello Dolly too. My kind of town, Chicago is. My kind of town, Chicago is. My kind of people too, people who smile at you and each time I roam, Chicago is calling me home. Chicago is one town I'd love to be in. It's my kind of town. And now for New York. Stop spreading the news. I'm leaving today. I want to be a part of it in of New York. These vagabond shoes. Little smile, Kara. Are longing to stray. And step around the heart of it in old New York. I want to wake up in, in a, a city that never sleeps. sleeps. To find I'm king of the hills, top of the heap. Da -da -da. These, These little town blues are melting away. I'll make a brand new start of it in old New York. If I can make it there, I'll make it anywhere. It's up to you, New York, New York. Chicago, Chicago, that wonderful town. Representative Joseph Diaguardi. 47 years old, second term Republican from New York. Key challenge in the 100th Congress, accountability in federal spending. I don't think that the public is getting a dollar's worth of goods and services for a dollar's worth of taxes. DeGuardi is a trained accountant and says the way to eliminate government waste and mismanagement is to introduce sound accounting principles. To that end, he's pushed legislation to have a chief federal financial officer appointed for 10-year terms. His job would be to manage the money allocated by Congress. DeGuardi insists congressmen think of their voting cards as credit cards for free shopping sprees. We have today in Congress a credit card mentality. This card, as far as I'm concerned, is the most expensive credit card in the world. This card has no limit. I'm proud of my record, Gabe. I've lived now in Westchester County for 29 years, and I've seen Westchester County grow from a bedroom community to one of the most impressive and economically stable regions uh, in the country. And I'm proud to say that it wasn't a government program that made Westchester County what it is today. It was the people. And that's why I left a career after 22 years in business to run for Congress, to see whether I can continue this as the greatest opportunity society the world has ever seen. And I've delivered for Westchester County. Two weeks ago, Mayor Noto and I, from Maranac, announced $4.3 million for senior citizens housing. Just my very last vote was on H.R. 6. Congressman Ottinger for 10 years has been looking to get authorized a massive flood control bill. Guess what? Joe Diaguati got it. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States and Mrs. Bush. Carl. Well, welcome to the White House and I salute the Vice President, Mrs. Quayle, and Secretary Cheney, other members of our cabinet, and General Vono, and distinguished members of Congress who are with us today, and uh, former Congressman Joe Diagardi. I'm especially glad uh, Joe's with us here today. To the former 
Medal of Honor re recipients, I salute each and every one of you. Uh, to Georgina Palmer and Mary Bowens, the sisters of today's honoree are with us. And don't they look lovely? We're just delighted. Today, Corporal Freddie Starris becomes the first black soldier honored with a Medal of Honor from World War I. He sought and helped achieve the triumph of, a, of right over wrong. He showed, as this year has proved again, that an inspired human heart can surmount bayonets and barbed wire. 73 years ago, the Corporal first was recommended for a Medal of Honor, but his award was not acted upon. In 1987, then Congressman Joe Diogardi and uh, my friend, the late Mickey Leland, known to many here from Houston, discovered the Stowers case while conducting other research. And the Army took up the case. And last November, the secretaries of the Army and Defense recommended that Corporal Stowers receive the Medal of Honor. I heard his story, accepted their recommendation enthusiastically. It's been said that the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge. Next, former Congressman Joseph Dioguardi will take your comments and questions about the federal budget and congressional budgeting process. After I left Congress, it dawned on me that if I was going to leave any legacy for the four years that I was there, it should be a report to the people of the United States of America as to what I saw as a professional CPA, having been trained for 22 years with one of the world's largest accounting firms, uh, to see certain things that the average person and certainly the average congressman uh, didn't see and still doesn't see. That we have a system, a budget process, uh, we have um, a system of accounting, a system of keeping books that is uh, not the system that government imposes on you. Uh, in fact, it's the worst system that can be used. And in the book, I uh, make the comparison between the bankruptcy of New York City in 1975 and the theoretical bankruptcy of the United States of America sometime in the future, making the case that the new bankers for the United States of America are not those banks who are buying the municipal bonds uh, of New York City back in 75, but Japan, Germany, Great Britain, who are buying tens of billions of dollars worth of treasury bills and treasury bonds. So we're kind of hooked on foreign capital. The point is that today, and let me give you the bottom line, the United States is using a Mickey Mouse accounting system. It's called the cash basis. They use it for the budgeting. They use it for the accounting. They use it for everything. It's a system designed for politicians because you can accelerate income. You can defer expenses. I dare say that if offices of a public corporation used the accounting principles and the accounting systems that the United States uses today, they would be indicted for securities fraud through the Securities and Exchange Commission and uh, no doubt would be incarcerated. Joe Diogardi, let me start with you. You're lobbying the U.S. administration on Kosovo. Where does the issue appear on the list of the U.S. administration's priorities in the first place? First, let me say that I'm the volunteer president of the Albanian American Civic League, the only registered lobby of the Albanian people here in America, uh, representing the concerns and interests of uh, some 400,000 Albanian Americans. And Kosovo is at the top of our list. Uh, I try to go to Washington as much as I can. I was there yesterday to speak in front of the Institute of Peace. There were many people from the State Department there to let them know that our foreign policy is a mess. It's failing that they have blood on their hands. Mr. Holbrook has blood on his hands. NATO has already discredited itself. Uh, we've been through this before. We saw it in Bosnia. We diddled, waffled, and dawdled for three years, saying that nothing could be done. And then finally, we couldn't take the bloodshed anymore after seeing Srebrenica and the Market Square in Sarajevo. We're seeing it right now in Kosovo. Well, and we acted. The Pentagon is saying now that uh, absolutely no consideration is given, or is being given, to sending in troops either from Canada or the United States. Well, we already have a force in Macedonia. Uh, I can't believe that they're not considering right now to expand that force, uh, that, that protection force made up now of uh, U.S. troops and Norwegian troops. I believe it totals about 600. 
Uh, it seems to me that the only answer right now is to show resolve. We didn't show it for two years in Bosnia, and we lost 200,000 people, and we had a, a, a conflagration there second to none. The ministers of the European Union are suggesting that further sanctions should be imposed in Belgrade. Is that going to work? Sanctions don't seem to work with Mr. Milosevic. That's what the hearing was all about. We did get a very tough resolution. It was made even tougher because of the efforts of the Albanian American Civic League that represents the concerns of 400,000 ethnic Albanians here in America. But sanctions will not be enough. We need to show resolve. We this should move an aircraft carrier off the coast of Montenegro. Let it stay there. We should ring Serbia with troops. Let them stay there. If we see one move, and don't forget, Ralph, two presidents drew a line in the sand. President Bush on the way out and President Clinton on the way in said if there's any military or paramilitary action in Kosovo, we would move swiftly. That question was put to Mr. Gelbard, Ambassador Gelbard, and he said that foreign policy declaration is still in effect. People were killed in the meantime by the time they did? Yes, and that's going to happen in Kosovo. That's why I want to know what you're suggesting now. What we have to do right now is to enforce international law. We have war criminals in Belgrade. We're dealing with one right now. I said that article before. I have a copy of it right here. Here it is. It was in the Gannett papers on Sunday. There's Slobodan Milosevic, side by side, Mr. Karadzic, who's now got a book coming out pointing the finger at him for all these atrocities in Bosnia. Why aren't we picking him up? U podršci albanskom separatizmu i terorizmu na Kosovu i Metohiji posebno se angažovala albanska emigracija u zemljama Zapadne Evrope i SAD. U Americi je 86. godine još osnovano albansko američka civilna liga pod predsjedništvom uticajnog kongresmena Josefa Diogardija, čiji je zadatak bio da aktivno lobira na Capitol Hillu. You have just heard former Serbian dictator and indicted war criminal Slobodan Milosevic misrepresent our important work in Washington to free Kosovo and all Albanians from the tyranny of his regime. Biden! 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 Just want to be sure he doesn't forget his name. <laughs> when you are the chairman of the Senate committee, you are at the top of the the game in Washington. And when you're the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, that means a lot to Albanian Americans, doesn't it? Yes, yes. 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 Have, to have the presence and the ear of someone like Senator Biden. It was during that time we convinced the senator to do a hearing on what was going on in Yugoslavia. This was 1991. The date of the hearing was February 21st, 1991. Senator Biden had in front of him me representing the Albanian American community, Kosovo, basically the issue, and then he had a Serb and a Croat and a Slovene and someone from Montenegro. You remember that? I do. And uh, he did a very fine job. And I remember when my five minutes was up, he said, "Well, you know, Congressman, you know the five-minute rule here. Try to keep to it." Well, he let me go 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but, as you know, after the 1991 hearing. Senator Biden emerged as one of the few and major voices in the U.S. government to challenge Slobodan Milosevic's genocidal march across Southeast Europe for 10 years. This is very I came for two reasons. Obviously, you're helping me, which I truly appreciate, and I came to thank you. But I want to thank you in another way as well. I want to thank you for an education, an education that has uh, literally, not figuratively, uh, changed my life. I thought I was relatively well informed. I worked very hard at it, and uh, I thought I was well informed. And one of the things that happened in that first hearing, Joe, when you came along with others to testify, you made a case that was compelling. The reason I let you, as they say, go on for 15 minutes was because I quite frankly lost track of the time. Because the case you were making was compelling. When Joe Diaguardi had his first important encounter with Senator Joe Biden, it was a hearing run by Senator Biden and Senator Pell. And Joe was testifying, warning 
the United States government that a war was raging in, in Croatia. There had already been one in Slovenia. And he said, he in fact implored the Senate committee, if you don't do something, if you don't act now, you are going to have a major war in the Balkans because Albanians cannot tolerate year after year, and we're talking really now 100 years, of racism, of torture. I will continue with every fiber in my being to keep America involved with troops that can shoot and kill to protect the rights of the Albanians wherever they reside in the Balkans. Let me define for you what I mean by finishing our job. We should stay till the job is finished. Let me define what that is. The definition of the job being finished is that there be a genuine growth of democratic institutions and the region, including Kosovo and Macedonia and Albania, a free and fair elected Albania, that they are on the road they're on the road to NATO membership, and they're on the road to becoming part of the European Union. Because until that moment arrives, there will be no real security for Albanians living in the ball. And my last statement would be that it is the Kosovar Serbs that need to be at the negotiating table in the fall with Kosovar Albanians, not Belgrade. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mrs. Diaguardi. Mr. Rohrbacher. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I'd like to uh, congratulate uh, Joe and Shirley Diaguardi for the hard work that they put out on uh, on this issue and this cause uh, over the years. And Thank it's uh, been vitally important that a, a group of people in, in desperate situations uh, in another part of the world uh, were given direction uh, on how to state their case and how to make sure that people understood what was going on uh, through the very complicated democratic process in the United States. So I think Joe and Shirley have done a tremendous job in making sure that uh, we got the picture of what was going on instead of a blurred picture of what was going on there. Well, I thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rohrbacher. Um, we will thank this panel for your great contribution to this important subject, and we will stay in touch with you. I'm sure we'll be hearing more from each other. And thank you, Shirley, and thank you. give our best to Joe. Thank you. I'll do that. Thank you. You are excused. We have another very special guest, the senior senator from the state of New York. I served with him in the Congress for four years, Senator Schumer, another Jewish American. Well, thank you, Joe, and it is great to be here this evening with all of you. I want to thank you for the warm and rousing reception, which I know is characteristic of Albanian hospitality and strength and fortitude, so I thank you for that. I am known in the Senate as someone who is very direct. The Albanian community is known as being very direct. That's one of the reasons we get along so well, and I thank you for that. I want to acknowledge Joe Diaguardi. You could not have a better spokesperson, advocate, leader than Joe. I was proud to serve with him in the House. And when you get the Diaguardis, you get a one-two punch. You not only get Joe, but you get Shirley as well. What is beautiful and why I am so honored to be asked to speak briefly here tonight is this. 
because you knew what it was like to be oppressed. You understood that it was your obligation to help others who would be oppressed. And that's what this community did during World War II. I have been told that there was only one country in Europe where at the end of World War II, there were more Jewish people than at the beginning of World War II. And that was Albania. So I came here tonight to say thank you. To say thank you for what you have done. We share many things, the Albanian people and the Jewish people, an understanding about hard work, a devotion to family and community, and the love of America and New York. And we will not forget, just as you helped us in our time of need, we are here to help you in your time of need, and the two communities will stand shoulder to shoulder together. Thank you. God bless you. And Ruft Kosova. introductory comments so that we can bring a good part of this group who weren't here at the last two meetings up to speed on what we're trying to do. I think everyone knows who Jerry Nadler is, by the way. He's a current sitting congressman. He represents the uh, Red Hook area of Brooklyn, uh, someone who has distinguished himself in the Assembly and now in Congress uh, in many ways, but specifically for us with his knowledge of the issue of an, uh, industrial and economic development in New York, mainly the, the port situation. For 15 years, Jerry has been trying to educate, inform his constituency and the public at large here in New York about the problems that we have here in the Port of New York versus the Port of, or at least the Port of uh, New Jersey. But the issue that we're trying to frame is that this is not a New Jersey or New York problem. It's a joint problem. And if we don't solve this problem of the Port of New York, we will lose the Port of New York as we now know it, or as we did know it, to places like Halifax and, uh, and Norfolk. And uh, all of you, I believe, know Mike Long, who's chairman of the Conservative Party of New York State. Now, at our last meeting, I made some comments and uh, characterized the first meeting between Mike Long and Jerry Nadler as one as uh, uh, love at first sight. Uh, and that turned out to be, in a sense, a mischaracterization, and Mike Long made some <laughs> comments. Uh, when, when we had that meeting, it wasn't, Mike, the fact that it was love at first sight for Jerry or his party. It was the idea. The idea being that we need a port in Brooklyn. We need a solution to the problems that we see right now with the crisis that they face for dredging on the Jersey side, with the fact that already the Port of Brooklyn, we have Sal Katucci, the owner and operator of the Red Hook Terminal, American Stevedoring here, to attest, and he will say a few words, to the fact that already there are ships bigger than can be accommodated in New Jersey, over 40 feet, that can only be handled right here off the, uh, uh, the channel in the Brooklyn Harbor, uh, basically Red Hook. And this is going to get worse and worse. Jerry's made some calculations. Uh, based on what is already being built and what's going to be built that will show that if we don't take some action, the port of New York will become obsolete. And in many senses, uh, and in many ways, it's already obsolete. And therefore, we will become a feeder port to what is happening already in Halifax and Norfolk, Virginia. We have politicians running around using rhetoric like accountability, transparency. They throw these terms around. And they throw the terms around lockbox trust fund. People have taken them at their word. People have voted for them. There's been an exchange of political capital here, moral capital, 
not necessarily financial capital. And the title of Mr. Spotcheck's book, where he put all those speeches together, is Fairness. Fairness in accounting and in financial reporting. That's the key word. Are we being fair to the next generation and to other constituencies by not indicating what the real liability is because we've promised it? Is the United States going to be competitive? Is the United States going to win this global battle now that we're in a global economy so we don't become a hostage to China and Japan? And we are almost there with the respect to the money that we borrowed, and I hope we continue to borrow, but somehow we've got to break that, that chain because it's not the right thing. If we want to be the leader of the free world, we cannot be a hostage to other nations. What you do is think about what made this country great to begin with. How did we overcome all these deficits? And how did we overcome this national debt without going under so far, although we're thinking that this could be a problem in the future? We are the most productive country in the world. We have a technology edge that put us there. And productivity offset all the waste that you've seen and many of these deficits. So who's to say in the future if we do the right things and we need to report where we stand before we can do the right things? That's why your role is so important. Who's to say that two people cannot become three with technology? So the issue is not to look at just the size of the family, look at the potential of two people to become three, four, five, and six if we are competitive and if we allow them the tools they need in order to produce and produce a technological term, <coughs> Microsoft, Google. That's what's keeping this country ahead of the game. Welcome to a citizen's initiative. And uh, let me say how proud I am to stand next to an elected official from Westchester County, Paul Feiner, a Democrat, my mother's favorite elected official. She couldn't wait to vote for you, Paul. Thank so you. you're a great public servant. Thank you. You know, there's, I remember my days in Congress. To do something important, you had to work with people on the other side of the aisle. I did it with Barney Frank, Tom Lantos, Jerry Nadley, even now at the tunnel from Brooklyn to Port Elizabeth. And it's a shame we don't see more of that. And it's a shame, you know, I saw yesterday uh, Mr. Ryan announcing his initiative, and it's always good to see initiatives, uh, but he may be reacting to an election, maybe his own. We're not reacting. We have been working on this for months. In fact, we were about to announce this right after the primary, figuring that's a good time, you know, September 16th, I think it was, and we were prevailed upon by the party leaders. We went to visit every party leader and said, you know, you might be kind of confusing the message of the campaign. Why don't you wait until after the campaign? So we did. I think the point is that this is not a reaction. This is a well-planned initiative by a group of uh, citizens. In fact, uh, we have a good part of the executive committee here with us, Dr. Bob Flower, Bobby Ann Cox, an attorney. We have Steve Mayo, an attorney. Kevin Riley, an attorney, couldn't be with us. And I mentioned the three attorneys because I wanted you to know that the basis of the petition drive has been vetted, not only by three volunteer attorneys who came up with a law that I didn't know about, the alternative, alternative form of county government law from 1952, but Jeff Binder, you here. We had to hire a prominent election attorney. He's been very kind to us with the fees, though, because he knows this is not a commercial venture. And uh, he then vetted everything so that what you're about to hear has been thoroughly uh, researched. 